What's up everybody, Pastor Matt, thanks for checking into the YouTube channel. I have a really fun discussion topic for us today, and this is gonna be one of those discussion topics that I know uh, you're gonna have an opinion on, and your opinion's gonna be different than mine, and I'll either be wrong, or you'll be wrong, or we'll both be wrong, uh, but I'd love to hear some of your feedback in the comments below. So today we're talking about kind of the fun question of, all right, what if you had to pick one theologian from each of the various epochs of Christian history? What if you could pick just one theologian from the several different major time periods of church history, uh, of course, going from Christ until today? So I actually think this might be kind of a good idea and maybe more than just a theoretical question. And the reason that I think that is because inevitably we're going to have to narrow the scope of all of the things that we choose to read. Now, I've mentioned before that you kind of have a choice in life between becoming a specialist and becoming a generalist. Now, both of those have strengths and weaknesses. If you're a specialist, and what that means is that you really, really hone in on one or two or three particular people, maybe an event, maybe an era, maybe a language, uh, maybe a series of events, but you really dial in on that one, two, or three things so that you become a recognizable expert on that topic. Now, the opposite of that, of course, would be to be a generalist where you try to have your knowledge as spread out as broadly as possible so that you can converse intelligently on a number of different things. So each of those two kind of approaches are going to have some advantage and some weakness to them because ultimately we are finite, we're small, we're weak, we only have so many years to live and there's so many, many, many books to read that of course we can't possibly master all fields of knowledge, at least not in this life. And so you're going to have some basic familiarity with a, a certain few things. And, and my question today I think what I'm trying to do here is to straddle that line between the expert and the generalist. And I think this might be an approach that could reasonably be taken so that you could be a little bit of both. Now, I don't know how successful this approach would really be, but let's at least talk about this theoretically. What if you were a specialist in, let's say, five theologians representing various epochs of Christian history um, you would have some very certain knowledge about those particular writers, their life, their insights, their major works, but they would also be spread out enough that you would give that would give you some generality to your knowledge. I think that might actually be a pretty cool approach, and then that way you could both narrow the scope and broaden the scope at the same time. And you could then contribute, I think, in a rather learned way to a lot of different conversations across the board. So the first thing we'd have to do in this kind of an approach would be to identify what are the major epochs of Christian history. And even attempting to set the parameters for what the categories are, I think, is going to be a little bit debatable. But let's just say for the sake of argument and discussion today that there are five major eras of Christian history. And this is how I would kind of work out those categories. I would say, first of all, and without much dispute, the, the, you'd have a category called early Christianity, whether we call that uh, the patristics or the anti-Nicene fathers or something like that, or the how far we go into the post-Nicene fathers, I don't know. Uh, but you'd have to set some kind of a parameter for the early church fathers. So let's just say, for the sake of discussion, and I realize you could divide the line in a different place, that the early Christian era would be something like from Christ until the fall of Rome. So we're talking something like, what what was that, 400 AD? I forget the exact year or series of years, but let's just say Augustine is that dividing point. We could have chosen the Council of Nicaea. That would be another a place where we could put that line. Um, but let's just say for the sake of discussion that it's from Christ to Augustine is the first period. Then the second period is going to be a really long one because we're going to have to call this period the Medieval Ages or uh, the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. Um, so that's going to be our major period that's going to be next until the Reformation. So let's go from Augustine to Luther then, let's say. That's your second category. Third category would have to be the Reformation itself, and this would be a period of time in which there's great fruitfulness in terms of Christian writing and thinking. Somewhat to uh, into comparison with the Dark Ages, I think we have a lot more to choose here, at least from my perspective we do. After that, 
we're going to have to again splice the line here in a certain place. I'm just going to call the next era after the Reformation the um, the Puritan or the Colonial or the High Calvinistic era. And here, of course, we're talking about the Puritans all the way up to Jonathan Edwards, perhaps even a little bit later than that. And then for the sake of discussion, let's call the modern era anything from the founding of the United States of America, 1776, to today. So those are our five categories. Now, we're going to be generalists, but we're also going to be some experts here. So who are you going to dial in in each one of those eras, picking one guy to comprise together your sort of Mount Rushmore of important theologians and scholars? Well, if we all pick the same, I guess that'd be pretty boring. Um, but nevertheless, let's try our best to see what we can do in each one of those categories. Well, welcome to this channel. If you are new here, my name is Matthew Everhard. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a Reformed, Bible-believing, Presbyterian church, part of the PCA. Just north of Pittsburgh, if you know anyone in the area, please come visit us or send them our way. We'd love to meet them in person, shake hands, high fives, hugs, handshakes, whatever you want. Gospel Fellowship PCA, come check us out. I um, also want to mention, by the way, I have a new newsletter, which I'm going to be sending out, I think, this week. So if you are interested in signing up for my newsletter, there is a link in the description of this video, or go to the pinned post on my Twitter page, or go to my highlights on Instagram. There's a bug flying in my face. Exciting start here, folks. I did want to also mention, too, before we get into what my five, my fave five is going to be, we have a theological conference coming up again this year, November 11th and 12th at Gospel Fellowship. This time we're looking at human sexuality called the Image of God Conference. We're going to have some great speakers, uh, including yours truly, but others from RPTS, the seminary, Reformed Presbyterian Theological Seminary, near us, just a little bit south in Pittsburgh. Um, and it's going to be an awesome conference on sexuality from a biblical and confessional standpoint. Very conservative, and uh, in some ways it'll be well, certainly a response to the chaos of our culture today. So I'd love for you to sign up for that. You can do so again in the description of this video. Um, hopefully the link will be there. I'll remember to put it there, I promise. Conference is free, but you do need to register this year. Uh, you do not need to donate anything, though there is an option to do so. Just please register so we can make plans for how many people are coming, etc. All right. So who are we going to select in each one of these five categories? This is exciting, isn't it? Well, early church. Um, and the, honestly, the first two categories are definitely major, major weak points for me. I don't have a ton of knowledge about the early church or the patristics or the medieval dark ages. I, I'm just not there. And so I'm going to apologize to you. There's that bug again. <laughs> Getting crazy over here. Um, th this wouldn't be my strong suit. And so when we think about the early church, you know, there's a lot of good options. There's also a lot of weirdness in, in the early church, if we're, if we're completely honest. But a couple names that come to mind, Irenaeus would be interesting. Origen would be interesting as a biblical scholar. love the fact that Origen had the hexapla, the six-column translation of the scriptures. He's one of our first real like critical biblical scholars. I think that's cool. Uh, Jerome, too, who translated the scriptures into Latin might be an interesting choice. If you're into the doctrine of Christ or the Trinity, somebody like Athanasius would be an incredible choice. And by the way, one who comes with a really extraordinary biographical background with his various persecutions and exiles, I think Athanasius would be an awesome person to study. I think my choice, though, is going to be Justin Martyr. And it's not necessarily because uh, he's the most influential or important of that era, but I think he is very curious enough and interesting enough in what he says. Now, um, there's not a ton of writings from Justin Martyr that are extant, and so I kind of like the limited scope because I don't know how much time I would put into this category, to be completely honest. I thought about Polycarp because he's only got one letter. That'd be pretty cool. You could say that you've read everything Polycarp has ever written. <laughs> and there's one letter to the Philippians, and then there's a little bit about Polycarp and his martyrdom. So if I want to go easy, maybe I'll choose Polycarp, but I think I'm going to take Justin Martyr as my first era guy. I've already read his first and second apologies, and so that leaves for me to work on his dialogue with uh, Trifo, the Jew, and a couple other little things, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, I've got a lot to learn about this era, and 
freely confess that this is a, a category of some ignorance to me, so Justin Martyr might be interesting. I think Irene, Irenaeus would also be pretty cool as well, but just for the sake of uh, arbitrary designation, I'm going to pick Justin Martyr as my first category person. Now, the second med major category, the medieval and the Middle Ages, again, man, I'm just woefully ignorant. And uh, you're probably wondering what ignoramus channel you're watching. Um, but it's not been an era of much interest to me. I guess I tend to really enjoy reading people that I agree with more than people that I disagree with. And so somebody who uh, might be huge in this category, like, uh, like, like a Thomas Aquinas, extraordinarily significant thinker, of course, famous for his five ways. Um, he is pretty important in a whole lot of different categories and obviously quite controversial today. I'm not sure if you're keeping up with some of the discussion boards on the Twitters and the social medias and all kinds of responses and, and uh, counter responses from people on the importance of St. Thomas today. How significant is he to uh, reformed Protestants in particular? I suppose there's quite an area of debate there. But I'm shying away from him, for one, because I know there's some major areas of disagreement, and two, I'm kind of just daunted by how much content there is out there. And so I'm going to select for my second person, uh, St. Augustine, which I think is the other, other major obvious choice. Now, you may say to yourself, hey, wouldn't he have been in the first category? And he could have been. Again, it just kind of depends on where you want to draw those historical lines. I'm going to put him in the second category, though. I think he does represent um, just a just a, a new movement, a new era of thinking about Christ, faith, and Christianity. Uh, certainly, he seems different enough to me from that first category of thinkers, writers, and theologians to put him in a class of his own. And of course, Augustine is such a monumental figure throughout history; it'd be hard to avoid him in uh, any any uh, Mount Rushmore of great theologians would probably want to inc include Augustine. But again, once, of all, once again, I confess my relative ignorance here. I have read his confessions. I have read them twice and maybe twice and a half, um, some sermons and some other shorter writings, but I have not read The City of God, and so that gives me quite a bit of work to do. And there is, there's just a ton of material from Augustine that's available, all of it interesting, all of it quite rich, his writings on the Trinity, etc. So I have a lot of work to do in this category before I could even remotely consider myself uh, mastering some of that material or working towards any kind of, of real expertise. So I'm taking Justin Martyr and then I'm going to take Augustine. Uh, let me know again who you take. But then when we move into our third era, which would be the era of the Reformation, though chronologically the time uh, we're narrowing it down to pretty much the 1500s, to be honest. This is a, is a short window in terms of a chronology, but there's so many monumental figures here that we could choose from. And we could definitely exhaust an entire lifetime just trying to do, do a, a superficial survey of the important Reformation era writers. Of course, Martin Luther, his Bondage of the Will, is a excellent book. Um, Luther would make an amazing person to really focus in on. There's so much there. Um, also Melanchthon, if you're Lutheran. William Tyndale, the translator of scripture into English, is a very important reformer. I'm not sure why he isn't more often considered among the greats, but he certainly should be. Uh, then you've got Zwingli. Again, I, th I think Zwingli is kind of underexplored today. I'm sure there was a time and a place when Zwingli was studied quite a bit and no doubt a, a figure of some controversy, but, but I think his whole story of kind of simultaneously claiming to discover the doctrine of justification by faith alone at the same time that Martin Luther does. Of course, they have their, uh, their fisticuffs almost, not literally, but, but they went, went at it about the Lord's table. And then Zwingli dies in battle. Uh, there's the famous sausage controversy. So I think Zwingli would make a really cool guy to be my guy. Um, he, by the way, is one who famously helped to bring expository passage-by-passage passage preaching into kind of the warp and woof of, of Reformed practice. So he might be an interesting guy. Um, but 
look, I'm Presbyterian, so I kind of have to do this, and you probably saw this coming from a mile away. My guy in the Reformation era has to be John Calvin, and I feel pretty good about that choice, to be completely honest, because I've already done quite a bit of work in John Calvin, and that's going to allow me some latitude and some freedom to catch up on what I really need to catch up on in the, or the early church in the medieval ages, which I'm just such a dunce in that era, admittedly so. But I've read quite a bit of Calvin, including his institutes. I have read cover to cover and many sections. Twice I've read abridged versions of his institutes. I've read some of his letters, some of his shorter writings, and I'm pretty familiar too with his commentaries, which are, you know, a mile long, but I do use the commentaries very, very regularly. And so I have a bit of facility and understanding the kinds of things that Calvin says and writes, the way he looks at scripture, I'm quite familiar with. And I've read uh, several important biographies about John Calvin. So I feel very good about that choice, especially his centrality to Reformed and Protestant thoughts. And then also quite, I'm not overly confident, I should say, but I feel good about the progress that I've already made in Calvin's study. So it's going to be a pretty easy choice in this category for me, which would be John Calvin. Now the next category is probably my strongest suit. And for the ignoramus that I am in some of the previous categories, the Puritan and colonial era would be a time in which I would probably do pretty well. Maybe we should call this the high Calvinistic era, but definitely we have to include the Puritans. And yes, the Puritans should be a distinct class from the reformers. The question here is how far do you extend this category in terms of time? What is the marking event that sort of ends this period? But when we look at the colonials and uh, the Puritans and the high Calvinists, you have to include the Dutch high Calvinists here too. You've got Turretin and John Owen and John Bunyan and Watson and Perkins and Van Maastricht is an interesting one. Let's come back to him in a second. But then you got to go with some of the, the colonials. Um, well, Whitfield too, and you have the Wesleys, and you have Jonathan Edwards. So, of course, my guy here is going to be Jonathan Edwards. Now, let's roll it back to Van Maastricht for just a second, because that's probably not a name that you're as familiar with. In fact, uh, we might think of several of those other guys as, uh, you know, being quintessential to the era. But I think that Van Maastricht is going to be more and more significant as time goes by. And though we're getting further and further away from the time in which he lived, Yet something is happening right now that's going to bring him more and more into vogue, and that is that Van Maastricht's great work, the theoretical practical theology, is finally coming into English translation, whereas it had only been in Dutch and Latin before. So if you're looking for a career in scholarship, uh, maybe you want to be a writer, a thinker, a theologian, professor, you would probably do pretty well to dig into Van Maastricht now before he explodes in popularity. And then you could kind of be on the cusp of being a Van Maastricht scholar. Uh, Edwards said that Van Maastricht had the best systematic theology that he'd ever read. And he says that in one of his letters quite famously. But um, as much as I love the evangelistic zeal of men like Whitfield, of course my guy here has to be Jonathan Edwards. It just has to be I've done way too much thinking, reading, and writing in Edwards to ever back off that train. And in fact, if anything, I'm just going to double down and really continue to commit to reading through the works of Jonathan Edwards. So here, not only have I, have I read quite a bit, but written extensively as well. And I continue to enjoy Jonathan Edwards, so I'm not bored of him yet. I feel like the, there's a lot of gas in the tank when it comes to my, my, uh, my desire and energy and interest in him. Right now I'm reading through volume 16 of the Yale works, uh, his personal letters, which is just a, just a, a glorious, I don't know, it's like a treasure chest of personal thoughts and correspondences. It's really the behind the scenes stuff that makes it so interesting because you already know some of his major works. You know, you know, religious affections and freedom of the will and original sin and, you know, his publish and unpublished writings on the Trinity. Uh, resolutions, of course, with my book, right? Yes, the resolutions. Um, but the personal letters are just really, really curious. And I'm definitely enjoying uh, digging into those now. So so that's my guy there. And for the sake of uh, for the sake of drawing a line somewhere, let's just say that that era ends in 1776. And that brings us then to the modern era. Now here again, 
Um, I just I feel like I know a lot more here than I would further back. So it's almost like the closer we get to my own time, the more I know about it. Um, the problem here is there's so many options. I don't even know how to narrow it down. And I have a choice, which I'll tell you here in, about, in just a minute. Uh, but you're probably going to laugh at me for my, my choice in this category because I, I doubt many of you would choose the same. But here we've got the Princetonians. You know, we've got guys like Warfield and we have Voss and we have... J. Gressa Machen, which would be an awesome choice to pick Machen. I'm not going to, but I, I wish I could. Um, I mentioned in a previous video, I've got all of Warfield's works right above my shoulder, which constantly beckon me to pull them off the shelf and read through them. Um, you could do Van Tilde, you could do Bonson, you could do Sproul. I think Francis Schaefer would be a really interesting choice. I might even choose him, I don't know. Um, and then you got guys like uh, who are still alive because the modern era, we're going to go all the way up to present time. So you could pick John Piper or John MacArthur, though I think eventually their significance may fade. It's hard to say. It's hard to say what's going to happen. Now, somebody might say, well, what about R.C. Sproul? And yes, yeah, Sproul is definitely significant. But I think the reason Sproul is significant is not necessarily that he said anything truly original or even groundbreaking in what he said. It's more the way that he was able to communicate using the modern technologies of conferences, uh, newsletter, study center, um, even capturing the, the power of the internet in some cases. And now definitely Sproul was a first rate scholar an intellect and a, a true man of God, gentleman as well. But um, but I don't think that there would be much there in the sense of like, what was his main contribution to theology? I, I don't know that there is one. I think he's more of a, a faithful repeater of tradition, which but by the way, that's kind of what I wanted to be. It's just a repeater of, of what has been said well and truly um, doctrinally and otherwise biblically throughout the ages. So no dig on Sproul. I just don't know that he, there'd be a, a, enough there of originality. So here's my choice. And again, <laughs> it's probably my most controversial of all of my choices. I think I might actually choose my professor, John Frame. Now, before you dig on Frame, um, know this. He has an incredible panoply of different works in uh, theology, but also philosophy. And so you can kind of straddle that uh, philosophically as well as theologically. He's got a very original contribution in his triperspectivalism, which I personally find very, very interesting and practically quite helpful. Um, but there's just enough there to really, really dig in for quite a bit. And because of frame is also sort of the gateway drug um, so to speak, to other thinkers like Van Til, he does, um, he does make a very curious person to study that gives you a taste of a lot of other things. He is confessional and he is also very, very biblical. So on a practical level, I think frame might be a good choice. Now I realize that when I put together my Mount Rushmore then, um, it's not what I would claim to be the best of all of the ages. I don't think you could really do it like that because um, I'd have Justin Martyr, Augustine, Calvin, Edwards, and Frame. And uh, of those, you know, Frame kind of sticks out as the one that, that maybe doesn't really fit. But I don't think Justin Martyr does either because I don't know that he's done enough to really, uh, to really deserve that spot on the Mount Rushmore of all time theologians. What you might have to do if you really wanted the best five is actually choose a couple from the same era. So you might have to pick a couple um, from the Reformation, for instance, in order to establish the greatest. So I'm not talking about the greatest. I'm not talking about the indisputed five best minds ever. I'm talking about one representative mind that really truly does give you the primary contributions for, from, each, from each era. Okay, so that's my list. Now, um, I would love to know what your list is, so please do share in the uh, in the comments below what you've selected. You can tell me if I'm wrong. I probably am wrong, uh, but I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on my fave five as well as hearing from you too. All right, well, thanks for checking into this video. I do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.